Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Connected Podcast. My next guests are international evidential mediums who each have 25 years experience in tutoring and demonstrating mediumship around the world. Their reputation is acknowledged and held in high regards globally for their evidence they are able to provide, the spiritual truths they share, and the spiritual philosophies and integrity they work with it. Their work has taken them around the globe. However, they retain their commitment to demonstrating and tutoring at spiritualist churches, centers, theaters, hotels, and other venues. Their aim is to educate the truth of mediumship and the reality of the spirit world to those that wish to learn or are seeking to find their own truths too. In delivering this aim, Phil and Carrie have worked on national and international radio, international television, internet podcasts, and with university scientific experiments and investigations. I'm delighted to welcome Philip Dykes and Carrie McLeod to the show. So nice to have you here. It's absolutely a pleasure, Courtney. Thank you for inviting us in. It's a oh, real pleasure to be here. Lovely. And whereabouts are you located? I'm, you're in England, are you not? We are. We're in the um, United Kingdom in England, um, just in a little city called Manchester. Lovely. And it's beautiful how internet technology can connect people like ourselves. It's amazing. One of the perks from COVID, I suppose, with the different, you know, advances in technology. So what I wanted to start with, maybe we'll start with you, Carrie, and then Phil, if you wanted to share your experience, I just wanted to get your, your thoughts on and maybe share your experiences in your early years of development. How did you know that there were these mediumistic abilities within you and what kind of encouraged you or inspired you to pursue developing those abilities? Mm. I think it comes as a similar story to maybe a lot of your listeners. Um, early in my young years, I had experiences which I had no clue were the spirit world. All I knew was that I had my own little world that I went into when things got a little bit tough. I had my own little friends that I used to um, interact with and I genuinely thought they were in my imagination. Because when I shared those experiences with my parents, I was told that I had a fantastic imagination and I really shouldn't tell that very many people. So I learned quickly not to tell people. And in some way, I, I actually think I programmed myself to not believe that any of it was real. So I kept it to myself and absolutely just believed what I wanted to believe. And then I grew up and I grew out of it, I think. I, th I got on with life, went to school, went to high school, went to university, got a career, had a family, and life just started to happen. But in 1996, I had quite a serious accident that firstly gave me lots of time off work. And secondly, got me asking those large questions in life of what happens when you die? What happens when the physical body gives up and, and goes into the ground or it is goes into that crematorium, what happens to the soul, what happens to the person? And as I did that, I think the analytical mind in me got the better of me, the analytical mind, the skeptical mind, because I learned to question everything. And as I did, I found myself doing those normal first steps of dowsing, using pendulums, using cards, creating more questions. And I ended up at the door of a spiritualist church in my hometown at that time of Dunfermline, which is just north of Edinburgh. And I met my future friend and tutor, Jock MacArthur. And I also received a number of readings over the next few years from well-respected mediums who said I would be working with the spirit world and traveling with the spirit world. I laughed it off as completely absurd. And Jock saw something in me. He nurtured me. He supported me. He was himself an incredible trance and physical mediumship, but was able to do platform work and private readings as well. And as I began to develop through Jock's mentoring and with developing through the spirit world, I found out that I had an ability there. I found out that the spirit world were willing to work with me, which still to this day is a little bit overwhelming. Yeah. Um, 
Jock and I and a few others set up a, an independent spiritualist church in 2004, which I then became president of in 2012 when he transitioned to spirit. Mm -hmm. And I left there just last year when um, I stopped living in Scotland and start and moved to England. So in over that period of time, I've moved from serving churches in the local area to in Scotland, to within the UK, to within Europe. And then I've been blessed for the spirit world to open the doors to working worldwide. And then something called a pandemic hit. And within yeah. two weeks of the pandemic hitting, Phil and I had online courses written and had that all taking place. And the rest, as they say, is history. Mm -hmm. Lovely. It's interesting how one single event can really open the door for the spirit world to guide and lead you into something that perhaps you didn't foresee, right? And they very much support you in that. And we know with your courses, you have hundreds, maybe thousands of students that are attending them, which is wonderful. So that reach through your mediumship, both of you, you're touching so many people um, due to this pandemic, in addition to what you were already doing. That's amazing. Phil, mm. if you want to share maybe a little bit about your early years in development. Absolutely. And it's not too dissimilar to Kerry's, really. But I've got to be honest, I was a bit of a nightmare. I was that why child. <laughs> I was always <laughs> asking my parents, what about this? What about that? And, and even though I know it now is the spirit world, back then it was everything to do and anything to do with the supernatural. So as that child, I loved the sci-fi programs, those um, ghost stories, absolutely everything. I was drawn to it. And even though now, as I look back, I was aware of the spirit world from a very early age. And I know people talk about speaking to the spirit world, having those episodes with the spirit world as a child. I've got them. But for me, it was an intellectual process. It's a way of challenging not just my thoughts and my experiences, but what was taking place mentally, emotionally and physically. So if I look back and I, I know we see a lot of pictures today on social media of orbs, but I used to have them in the bedroom going through, but there was like a telekinesis. There was like a mind to mind communication taking yes. place. Sometimes it's very audiently, um, very loud where my parents would come up and say, who's awake? And I'd be thinking, well, I haven't made a sound, but it, it, it was that real. Um, and even where there was a physical element to it where I know we all talk about seeing spirit, but actually them sitting on the bed and I could feel the bed go down. So it was very intriguing. It used to be frightening, I've got to admit, at times, because we're not educated to what is taking place. But it, I think that forged my mindset to exactly the person I am today where I want to understand. But it led my mind to almost challenging the spirit world more what can you actually do because i know you can speak with me i know you can have that physical presence and i know i can sense you and as you grow up with those perceptions or that insight you start to pick up on things around people and very quickly i walked into a spiritualist church and i always remember it thinking oh this is a little bit different but it felt like home. And I met a wonderful gentleman there called John Gilbert. And unfortunately, he's now in the spirit world. But he used to just sit, look over. And now and again, I'd ask him questions. And he was a quiet man that used to just tell me little bits. But I understood that was his way of just nurturing me to find those mm -hmm. other answers. But again, it, it's almost where I want to talk about a, a journey through unconventional means. It wasn't all within the churches. I actually started to uh, develop in what we call the paranormal world. Uh, today, paranormal doesn't exist to me because it's normal, but it wasn't the things you <laughs> see on TV. It wasn't these um, supernatural things uh, uh, and mocking the spirit world. It was the intellectual uh, experiments questioning and challenging and to see tables move and, and spell names out and the planchette go from numbers and, and even where I used to send those thoughts and say if it's really you you'll, you'll communicate you'll spell this name you'll do this or interact in a way but I wouldn't take part in the experiment when people used to read the name out I used to just make me smile because I thought no that's the intelligence working so I've always yeah. had that mindset 
And because of that mindset, I've gone looking for things such as cyclical research units and societies. And I met a wonderful gentleman called Nick Kyle in the Scottish Cycle Research um, Society. And he helped me find some answers that I was looking for. So I always had that interest, but it's led me into unusual areas, being tested by universities, meeting people of, of that scientific understanding of spirit communication and challenging myself. And even within my own mediumship today, challenging the evidence again, because what I understand of the spirit world is very much where they give us a little tiny bit to give us a lot. So yes. my early development was very much different and I'm sorry for all those tutors I had there was a nightmare for that questioned and asked lots of difficult questions and I didn't mean to be impertinent or anything else and I'm sure they, they know that but it was just my mindset I wanted to know more and and somebody told me an answer it wasn't good enough I had to find the experience myself and I feel it's very healthy and it helps me understand the student of today because they're looking for their own answers they're looking for their own yeah. truths and it helped me develop and even where I was asked things like what I mentioned before about university tests where I was like open to it yes of course and I met some wonderful people and along the journey able to meet some DJs ended up working on national radio stations and doing lots of charity events and and again it was a way of challenging that ability. Well, if you really hear, I don't need to see somebody. I don't need to hear the voice. We can connect and, and give you that information before you even come on the radio. So um, my early development was, again, very similar to Kerry through the churches, different kind of mindset with the paranormal, mm -hmm. but looking at different tools and challenging them saying, well, it's just a, a a way of opening the mind to seeing different things and receiving different kinds of evidence so again sorry for all those tutors i had that i, I probably gave nightmares <laughs> to and sleepless nights um but it, it's just my mindset i, I want to ask these questions i, I want to challenge everything mm -hmm. um, so i think for me i always lived in that daydream world as a child and i think that helped me because it allowed me to see things from different perceptions of my own little world. And it helped me get an understanding of self that helped me within my mediumship. And I think without that, I think I would have struggled a little bit. Beautiful. What a very similar, but quite different. And often people would not think that there could be a correlation between paranormal investigation and then mediumship, but yet the two worlds can those two aspects can actually complement each other if they're done with respect for the other world right. without like the provocation i think there is a need for that um you said something was really interesting and i actually had grown up in a christian home um which is quite different to where i am now but that's okay and you know there was this saying that was said you know to test the spirits and it's kind of a little bit of what you were doing. It's like, well, you're showing me this, but what else can you do? How else can we prove that this is real, right? And I think that's a good thing. If we have one single experience, that quest or that thirst to really prove it, going from believing to knowing can really uh, be quite insightful. And it's not about being disrespectful with the spirit world, but it's validating for yourself that these experiences are in fact true. Phil, how did your um, experiences with the university go with testing and things like that? What did that look like for you? Um, it, it's come in different forms, actually. It, it was, I've got to be honest, they were very open minded. I was under the impression they may be skeptical, um, but the, there was a few things we had to um educate them to what spirit mm -hmm. is about and what psychic and once we got through that it was quite eye-opening so um the first experiment i did was taken in, in a, a church and, and got to be honest it was my early development days mm -hmm. so i didn't know really what i was engaging in I, and i walked into a spiritual church where the university had hired and all these big name mediums i'm thinking what am I doing here? <laughs> and I sat at the table, we weren't allowed to speak and everyone was just looking, it was like an awkward silence. It's like being in a, in a waiting room in, in a socially distant environment. We must, you're not allowed to speak. So you felt a little bit awkward, but then you were led to individual rooms and um, you were put uh, made to wear a boiler suit. So in other words, you, you were stripped and given clothes and you were locked in a room, you had a camera and it was psychometry. And I, I, I actually put up an argument and said, it's more of a psyche exercise than proving the spirit world, but there's something we can do. And so long story short, 
Um, we got all the details, the history of the implements they gave us. But then at the end, I said, I, I put the object down and I, I started to work with the communicator, the, the loved one that, or the owner, and they could actually research, which was really interesting. But those people, that, that first one was for somebody's master's degree, um, but it opened their mind to different ways of thinking. And the last one that I took place in was for, again, a different university, where they were looking about the intelligence of the communication, not just the evidence, but in what order? And if they pick numbers by a computer in a different part of the United Kingdom, would they come out in correlation within the contacts? Um, and I must admit, Kerry was there that evening and uh, she saved my life on two occasions. One, because I was blindfolded and I had earmuffs on Defender, so I, I couldn't hear or see anything. Didn't yeah. even know anyone was there. But if you can imagine somebody facing an audience not able to see, then by the end of it, I was facing the wrong way and on the edge of a high platform. And Kerry had oh. to rush to the front to um, make sure I didn't, and she's laughing at the side of me, um, had to make sure I didn't fall off. But it was incredible the way that the spirit world showed their intelligence to get to the people. And unbeknown to me and Kerry, or well, Kerry was that she could see, um, they were holding boards up saying yes and no. So I wasn't aware of it. But entering into the, the whole sense of it, the, the uh, professor who designed the um, investigation um, said, would you like to know what we're up to? And I said, absolutely not. I want to be out of the way. I want to know nothing about it. I want it to be a blank canvas. So for me, it's another way of challenging the spirit world healthily mm -hmm. by yes. questioning that intelligence, by seeing how they could um, bring their evidence to the person. And in that demonstration, I said, I need to go to the person on the back row third from the end. And it, it was really good. And even where I corrected myself without even yeses or noes, so it shows the intelligence that really does move through us within that consciousness, within that power. Um, but again, it's not for the faint hearted. It, it is a bit of a challenge. And I think you've got to have that mindset that mm -hmm. really wants to seek even more truth. And to put yourself on that line, people say, oh, you're very brave. Yeah. It was a natural process. Every time that myself and Kerry work, we're in that environment. That's our mindset. What is it you're giving yeah. us? How can you prove it? There's a logical understanding we both have of if you can prove it to me, then it's going to be believable to that person in front. So again, that's that mindset that we have. So working for those universities, doing going through those experiments, could say could have been quite brave, but it's our intellect, it's who we are. It's, it's having that question and wanting to know more and what the spirit world is really capable of. And it's really you having to maintain that connection with the spirit world and any kind of fears or trepidations there's no place for it otherwise it hinders your work correct and you're so beautiful and that's a real testament even for mediums that are developing or well-established mediums and they want to keep progressing and elevate their mediumship we got to keep raising the standards and pushing ourselves not so much the spirit world but again i love the the phrase that you use challenging the spirit mm -hmm. right and what else can we work with this and beautiful that i'll say you are brave because i don't know if you catch me doing that <laughs> but i think if you work as a medium as i know you do Courtney, yes. and everyone else yeah. that's listening we myself and kerry have this little thing that we say we don't question the spirit world with the mind we challenge mm -hmm. through that conscious soul what we're being given and i think that's a healthy thing to have mm -hmm. whatever level we are whatever stage of development we are to challenge and, and see that bigger picture because we're dealing with a very intelligent world that's given us far yes. more than we can possibly conceive and once. i think that showed itself just before the pandemic hit we were doing online demonstrations unheard of before because there wasn't really a need for it then we did a live theater demonstration from um fort lauderdale. fort lauderdale and it was streamed worldwide live and that was in november actually it was december 2019 it was, yes. so we had already moved to the places where people had said that will never work it'll never take off <laughs> and then when we did our first sunday gathering which was about 10 days after most of the world had gone into lockdown in mid-march 
the amount of people that said that will never work. You'll never get people coming online. The spirit world doesn't want to work online with mediums. Mm -hmm. Well, once we've set the bar, you talked about raising the bar. It really is necessary to always be challenging. If the spirit world don't want to work a certain way, I'm sure they would be saying we don't and they would step back. But all we felt as a, is an encouragement from the spirit world to get that raised bar out there, to get the understanding of what mediumship is about and to let people know what to expect when they get a mediumistic and it's um, evidential mediumistic reading. And, you know, it's so limiting. I don't I don't quite understand in some aspects I do why the humans that we we're all human, but those that still have physical bodies, why we limit the other world, they are an intelligence mm -hmm. and why we limit how they can come in and connect with us and mediumship. My understanding is about proof of survival, but at its essence and its core, it's all about healing as well. And the spirit world at this cusp of the pandemic through to now has recognized that need and of course they're going to work with us and all of these technologies to bring through that evidence that proof of survival and that they're wanting to support us with what's going on in the world it's beautiful and you know you guys very much inspired myself and my church the other minister because we were shut down we had a physical center, but we couldn't go in. And we recognized that there was this need to still bring through that philosophy and that those teachings from the other world. And we ended up very quickly uh, going on Zoom. And that was what was able to help us keep that center today, which we're now able to go back into because of the work that you have done along with Sandra Champlain on the We Don't Die radio and your Sunday gathering. Um, and it, we didn't know how it was going to work. How is this going to work? How is mediumship going to work? Oh my goodness. That is challenge. It was challenging, but it's like, no, there's this need. Spirit's going to support us. And you guys really have inspired, I'm sure, so many other people besides our small center as well. So thank you for being courageous and really pushing the bar and showing others what can be achieved if we trust and if we're willing to move forward and trying out new things. Well, thanks for sharing with us because it's it's interesting to see what we did because we felt it was the right thing. It's always interesting to hear how the knock-on effect has been. So it's lovely to hear. It, it is. Yeah. And if, if we look at spirit communication, the history of it, we can talk about the religion and we can look at the actual facts of it. Mm -hmm. Spirit world's always found a way of communicating, getting our attention all the way back at the Hydesville, even yeah. to this pandemic through Zoom. It's, it's touched and reached so many more people. It's hard to believe that people said it won't work, it won't happen, it's disrespectful. But actually, once we did that demonstration, I, rem I remember the first one we did, we were so nervous. Will it happen? What, what, how will this work? Um, and, and when we got going, we absolutely loved it. And we thought, this yeah. is a new way. And it, and it really dawned on us that we were helping so many with it. As you've said, it's a knock-on effect mm -hmm. that other yeah. churches and other centres and other people have started up. But we've met people from religions I've never heard of. I've met people from different parts of the world. And it's built a community that we all can thrive within, but also talk and share our truths and debate these truths about spirit communication. Yeah, it's absolutely lovely. And there's some centers that haven't, they, they lost their physical center locally here. And we're very blessed that we haven't, but they still have this technology in which they can still share um, the beautiful teachings and philosophy and prove life after death uh, through that spirit communication because of people who have, sh you know, set the example and really shown us how to do it, <laughs> at least what we want to aspire to be. So that's absolutely <laughs> lovely. And what I'm curious, so y you still continue to demonstrate, but how did this, was it a natural progression moving into teaching mediumship and psychic development? I think when the spirit world are looking at what they need from us as mediums, we have to be willing to just move to where they want us. For me, 
Um, the teaching was a natural step. I've always found um, the ability to be able to share whatever I understood in that moment, no matter which subject was about, but I've always been passionate about mediumship. I always was passionate about the pioneers of the past and their mediumship always came and got stronger at times of need in the world. So if you look at the times going through the First World War and the Second World War, the incredible level of need that was there in the population of the, of the world, I'm not saying that it's a similar experience, but the level of need that happened through the pandemic was tantamount to needing proof that there's something there, that there is something worth um, believing in. And so when we moved from demonstrating and from doing private readings, it seemed there was a natural flow to teaching. The teaching part has always been before to people who understood what a mediumistic ability was. It was about people who had spent time developing on their own. And during the years just before the pandemic and during the pandemic, we found people who were grieving, wanting to have their own communication with the spirit world. Mm -hmm. We've had people who have had that spiritual awakening process and are really, really curious as to how what's happening to them relates to a spiritual ability, which mediumship is. Because if we look at mediumship being part of the psychic ability, mm -hmm. the psychic ability is something everybody has. And when we are spiritually unfolding or spiritually awakening, all our sensitivities increase to a point where we're aware of a world that we weren't before. We hear so often people saying, suddenly the spirit world came to me. You no, know, the spirit world have already, have always been there. Suddenly you increased your sensitivity and awareness to a point where you were aware of them. And that's where we try to reverse some of the, um, the thinking of people about the spirit world coming out of the darkness into their mm -hmm. world and also to demystify there's an awful lot of myths out there that overly yeah. complicate that bemuse people that befuddle people and we're really um, passionate about being able to share the learnings and allow everybody to know that they have an ability within them whether they're meant to be a medium or whether they're meant to enjoy having a mediumistic ability is yet theirs to find. We're not going to stop anybody developing their mediumship because we firmly believe that the spirit world will be able to use each and every single person with the mediumistic ability they have within the area of life they choose to use it. Not all mediums need to be doing private readings yeah. or standing on the platform or indeed healing or being in trance. There are so many more avenues the spirit world can use people. Mm. And, sorry, go on. Um, thank you for making that comment because there is this debate which I've come in contact when I speak with other mediums or ministers. Mediums are either born or they're made. And through my own experiences, I just, in, in connecting with people, I really feel that everybody can learn to connect to the spirit world to varying degrees, but to what extent that mediumship will develop is, it, it could be quite different. And I use the analogy when I'm teaching circle or a class, you know, everybody can learn to play the piano, but not everybody's going to be a concert pianist. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying I'm a concert pianist to my listeners, but what I'm saying is, is everybody can learn, even if it's just for their own healing and to connect to their loved ones. So it's so lovely for you to, to share that comment, Carrie, because it's true. Some people go, well, I'm not a medium, so I'm not going to be ever able to connect with my loved ones. And that's not the case. And I think there's something additionally in there about each person being able to follow their mediumship, but not pushing it. We see so many yeah. people pushing their mediumship because they want it for maybe their own gain or for their own reasons. Mm -hmm. But actually, when we've had a, a chat with them, and this is where the tutor often has to have that honest conversation, mm -hmm. is... We have to be honest with the student of mediumship and say, your mediumship is unfolding. However, your interest in creativity or music or dance or art 
seems you come alive when you talk about it. It seems to be something you're passionate about. Why are you forcing yourself into developing a mediumship when actually the spirit world maybe want you to express who you are in a different way? Enjoy your mediumship and enjoy being passionate about something that comes so natural that Phil and I may be a little bit envious of the ability that they have. <laughs> Absolutely. One of the wondrous things about people development, spirit communication and what the spirit world can do is phenomenal. And to see people that don't have any, um, how can I put this, belief in self or don't have that confidence. And we, we listen to some of them. Oh, my God, if we only had it as clear as that at times or in our early development. So it, it, it really is a wonder to be able to teach. And very similar to Kerry, I came into it the same way. Um, but as I go back to that why child, that was my way in because I started to question, challenge the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And through my own experiences, I used to say, why are you doing these things with me? Uh, and when I first experienced the trance state, it was like I'm experiencing this. I can't really interact with what's happening, but I'm aware of what's happening in the background. And it, it, it almost where they took me through things step by step so I can understand it. And as I look back now, I thought, well, that's my education. That was them saying, well, we're teaching. We're not just doing it. We're teaching you. We're taking through all these processes, all these steps. We're keeping you aware of it so you can help others. So for myself, it's quite a natural step moving from developing into the mediumship of, of teaching where where was that I don't know pesky little person that was asking loads of questions and annoying people and um, for me it was healthy having that mindset yeah. to then saying well there's more to the answers that I'm getting there's more here to spirit communication and when I asked people they didn't seem to really have the answer or what I heard back wasn't mm -hmm. in depth enough so having that development having th those um, experience of trance of mental mediumship and even in mental mediumship as you know Courtney and Kerry and everyone else listening we've still got to have one foot in the spirit world but we're still going to still have one foot here because we've got to present it but to have your consciousness shifted while still being aware of it mm -hmm. being aware of your emotions deepening the evidence but also mentally having the thoughts and interaction being active in the communication mm -hmm. helps you really see what the spirit world's capable of and also makes you have more questions. So that was my way into teaching and, and to bring those experiences to people to say, you know what you're going through that you feel a little bit daft about or mm -hmm. you're not quite sure how to ask that question because there's only one daft question and that's the one you never ask. So yeah. it, it, exactly. Yeah. So we've got to be there for people we've got to support people we've got to say you know what this is an okay space this is a safe space to ask mm -hmm. these questions and whatever you've heard before because if we're honest there's no handbook there's no development yeah. where you come from a child to that adult to really explore what mediumship is and what the spirit world is there's many books that people have given of their own experiences but we can't read them all so we've got to live our own so that teaching is important to us because we want to be there for those that where we didn't have those people there for them for us but also we want to give those answers that can help people move forward and say it's okay to be in this place and have these questions and go through these mm -hmm. things i think that was partly behind when we set up the spirit and soul foundation was about having the standard set but also we were seeing so many different types of mediumship being demonstrated mm -hmm. and in some cases what we would see as a watered down effect of evidential mediumship so i think we felt that we would be able to pass on the efficacy the moral standards um the the high standards that the pioneers of the past fought yes. for for us to be able to demonstrate our mediumship we felt that we'd been given a platform with which to share that understanding mm -hmm. of it might not be for everybody but to share those understandings of the past with the mediums of the future is incredibly important and those standards and morals and ethics and the integrity to see the spirit world and every spirit person as a real person because often mm -hmm. we see mediumship demonstrated where 
the person's reduced to a list of facts and figures yeah. and and they've ceased to become a real person and for us yeah. that just didn't seem right and that's why we came together in, in order to do the spirit and soul foundation with that in mind i love that that completely resonates because um I, I've tutored or mentored, been mentored by um, a well-known tutor at um, the Arthur Finley College, and I did a private mentoring um, program with this individual, and it almost felt kind of like a shopping list. I got to check all these things off, but where there was lacking that essence of the communicator, it was about who they were, who they were, what they did. Um, which is an important component of it, but it wasn't bringing in that they're still very much alive. And what are they doing now? And what are they, what are they aware of, of in my life? What do they want to share with us? And um, so that resonates quite, um, quite a bit with myself and everybody has their own standard and style of reading, but I, you guys resonate. So it's good. <laughs> and, and, this kind of, <laughs> and this kind of moves into my next question. What are your thoughts or comments, if you're comfortable even sharing, of the standard of mediumship on the world stage today? Oh, um, I think I, I've got to be honest. I think there's some really good people out there that are leading the way. Uh, there's some incredible people out there with potential as well. We can't be the, how can we put this, the mediumship, mediumship police. police. Yeah, we can't be the mediumship police, yeah. okay? But I mean, there's good, there's bad, and there's the ugly sort of thing, like the film. Yes. Okay? <laughs> uh, put it politely that way. So it, it, we, we can't knock anybody. We, we've got to set a benchmark. We're, we're mm -hmm. trying to raise the standards wherever we can, and I'm sure everybody in their own way is. But it's having the understanding, and I think this this part is key, the understanding of what spirit com communication is. As you've just mentioned, Courtney, about being in the essence of the communicator, we hear a lot, well, what's the point of that? English mediumship's a bit boring. And I think to myself, what a shame they, they, they don't really understand this bit. Because the essence brings the communicator alive. It tells the story of their life. It helps you understand the evidence. But also, more importantly, it helps you become more aware of the message through the evidence. There isn't a separate yes. message of the communication, but it's through that evidence that's in the message. And that's what we've got to keep on going. And if we don't have the standards, and, and I think it was Emma Harding Britain in 1901 stated, if we don't sort this movement out, if we don't sort these standards out, within a hundred years it become entertainment and unfortunately what mm -hmm. do we see now as entertainment but mm -hmm. true spirit spirit communication as you mentioned earlier is about inspiring the living through evidential fact and proof that we're still surviving having that evidence that proves beyond a doubt but also that little bit you added Courtney proving that they're still around us wanting mm -hmm. to interact there doesn't have to be a reason why they come because simply they love us they're choosing mm -hmm. to come forward. It brings comfort, it brings healing, but I'm sure everybody in their own way, whether it's a church on a street corner, whether it's somebody organizing an event, whether it's a, a retreat, they're doing their best, doing their part yeah. to really bring those standards mm -hmm. up. And I think for every medium that we see or hear of that has delivered a reading or a demonstration that we might not agree with, there, to be honest, there has been times where Phil or I have done a private reading and we are cleaning up a mess that a, another medium yeah. has created um, through false prophecy, through bad information, through information that really should not be delivered in a private reading. There's also the stories where people say, well, I went to this demonstration and I know they aren't a good medium, by the standards that you might measure them, but they got me interested. Mm -hmm. They got me asking questions. So if I were in the spirit world and I was in, I don't know, if I was the president of mediumship in the spirit world, <laughs> would I rule out somebody if I knew that they were going to be the person that would create an understanding in another and a curiosity and maybe yeah. be a seed that was planted to that person for them to start their spiritual unfolding? I don't know. So, yes, if we're measuring mediumship in terms of evidential, in terms of 
psychic evidence definitely not being mediumistic evidence yeah. and vice versa if that's an understanding and a, a, a measurement stick then it's fairly easy to measure what's psychic what's mediumship what's evidential mm -hmm. and what's not but in terms of creating an understanding within within somebody I, I'm not sure it's as easy to measure because I know there are a lot of people um, working supposedly with the spirit world, perhaps not, perhaps they are, perhaps they're not working in a way that I might approve of, mm -hmm. but they bring somebody to me that might well um, be on their journey because of it. If I may, um, I think it's what you said before, Courtney. I think we're all entitled to a communication directly from the spirit world everyone's got that ability to receive it i think some of us have a more of a natural ability mm -hmm. that they will demonstrate some will be private reading mediums some will be healers and there'll be other people that do different things mediumship mm -hmm. is unique to the person how they see it it's a byproduct of who they are mm -hmm. and unless we can get the education out there and the understanding out there then people are doing their best so as Kerry said, we can't be the mediumship police or, or make a judgment. They are doing their best, but yeah. it's just trying to get them. And this is what we love about teaching. We're bespoke to the individual. We see where they're at. We listen to them. And each person has an individual learning style. And once we can start to see them and understand them, we can correct things or maybe yes. enhance things. Correct, mm -hmm. probably not the right word. Maybe enhance things that helps people move forward and maybe see it differently to help them become that better medium, that have that better mm -hmm. servant to the spirit world of what the communicator is trying to bring forward. For me, that I think that's probably the better question. Because when we are working with people, what we find is in the past, tutors of mediumship have said, here's the mechanics, here's the formal training, and there'll be this other part called personal development, and you'll need to do that elsewhere. And what we found is when it's done elsewhere, it's one of those things that never quite get to the top, gets to the top of the to-do list. It's always put on weight. I'll go to a, a retreat and I'll blast it in one week and I'll be done with it. It isn't like that. No. So our, our tutoring, although we don't handhold, we do support, we do challenge, but we're all about empowering people because if somebody's not empowered to own their own mediumship, I remember Jock saying to me, you'll be a fine medium when you can own your own power and own your own mediumship without making an wow. apology or undermining it in any way. I didn't know what the heck he meant, now I do. 20 years on, I, I need. To, I, I wish you were still here that we could have some physical conversations because I'm sure yeah. to have some great conversations with them saying, you could have said it better, but that was <laughs> that's the best tutor's way, isn't it? Yeah. They, they talk in ways that only lands with us when we're ready. Lovely. And it's interesting, though, too, where people will separate. They just want to focus on the mediumship development, but not recognizing that a big part of the mediumship development is our our personal progress and inner healing and they well i guess it's a matter of opinion but i don't think they should be separated because they're very much um, interconnected and so dependent on one another what we've actually said is mediumship will happen when somebody spiritually awakens and unfolds when somebody mm -hmm. follows their mediumship without the other they will end up traditionally mechanical and um not able to get into the essence of the communicator because yeah. they're not really able to be comfortable with themselves the good the bad and the ugly mm -hmm. so one is absolutely reliant on the other happening do you i uh, this question goes up to both of you do you have any advice for those that are listening who are in the early stages of their development and perhaps maybe a little confused as to what direction that they should go or any tips that they have you have for them um i think we've probably got dozens of tips we could we could probably give um how long have we got courtney um <laughs> if, a final if, a thought a thought, a thought, then, a thought, a thought. Okay, a thought. 
if I've asked, told everyone that the mediumship is a, or the spiritual development is a byproduct of who they are, really get to know self, those self-limiting beliefs, really understand what they are, where they come from and work with them and manage them. But also they've got to be true to who they are. Uh, and the more that they sit with the spirit world, and this is the important bit here, the more they sit in the power and build that bond and blend with their team, with that spirit world, that's where the real development takes place within that sensitivity, within their awareness of emotions, their consciousness, um, the mental faculties. Once they start to grasp that and, and start to listen to that voice through their soul within their mind that comes from the spirit world that they know it's not their thought that's where we start to get that self-belief and those abilities start to show i remember asking the same question to the spirit world what am i meant to do where am i meant to be why why am i comparing myself to others and watching others am i meant to go that way and and all i heard from the spirit world when it's your time you'll know and i thought well that wasn't really the answer i wanted <laughs> but it made me sit and the experiences I had with the spirit world soon taught me and showed me once I started to listen and see and take notice where I was meant to be going and it started to unfold because when I heard that I stopped pushing and I just started to surrender to that power. And uh, Similar to what Phil has just said, mediums or developing mediums often push their mediumship in the, in the, the direction that they feel they want to go in. Mm -hmm. People often want to get to platform mediumship or the private reading medium. And actually the spirit world might be asking them to go in a different direction. And in that space of sitting with the spirit world, the spirit world can let you know because only the spirit world can let the individual know exactly where they need to go. But it takes time and it takes a dedication to that meditative, that sitting in the power Um process and that discipline of sitting in the power i know we have i know you're going to put some links up we have some downloads that will help people find their way into being able to sit in the power we've also got ones that help them understand their purpose or self-healing or um mm -hmm. get introduced to their guides but we also have something we've literally just finished and it's called the six stages of spiritual awakening and it's a, a podcast that walks people through the different stages through the awakening, that blissful stage, that mm -hmm. stage where everything just suddenly becomes really hard and we get really despondent, that mm -hmm. stage where we want to hide away from people. And then that stage where we begin to release pressure and we begin to stop pushing and we surrender to that yeah. creative force of life to then the stage of being in full commitment to the purpose that we know that we're here for. But it mm -hmm. isn't chronological. It doesn't do a full circle no. and then you're done. We kind of dart between. <laughs> so we can we can share that with your listeners and give those links out because it's a really challenging journey to do. And if we focus on the mediumship, then it, we can become a little bit disillusioned. What we ask people to focus on is what's your why? Why are mm. you doing this? Because when life gets really tough, the answers of I want to help others, I want to give the spirit world a voice, I want to create healing, I can guarantee they will mean next to zero when you're in your lowest place, yeah. only getting in touch with why are you doing this? That will create, I certainly know for Phil and I in our own journey, getting in touch with that why and that connection with an unseen world is all you ever need for the good and the bad times. It's beautiful. You say that your why, it keeps you anchored in your purpose and why you're doing this. So regardless of the external circumstances, it gives you that strength to keep pursuing the development and whatever direction it takes. I'm just going to share uh, something small, but Phil, you mentioned the word surrender. When I, uh, years ago when I started sitting in circle, in the center of the circle, there was a small table and there was these beautiful stones that had different words painted on them. So when we would be sitting, it would be a focal point of something for us to, to think about it as we're sitting and developing. And one of them was surrender. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, it's so true. If we can surrender to the power of the spirit and allow them to move through us, we just might be surprised at what 
can be achieved through our own unique development at whatever level we're at. So and can I give you an example of yes, surrender? Please. I can give you many. Good. I'll give you one. When the pandemic first hit, we had 18 months work kind of swept off the table, which is not an uncommon story. Many, many people yeah. had much more difficult um, experiences. And Phil and I began to focus on what can we do? What can we do? We must do something. We must. And nothing worked. We did this for about two days. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when you've trusted in something and you've surrendered to do the opposite for two days is extremely painful. And then we both sat in the power. We both came out and said, you know something? We need to just give and surrender. And within 24 hours, things had shifted. The spirit world will take everybody that's listening. The spirit world will take people in the direction they need to go. You have to set your intention and be committed in that direction. The spirit world can't make the decision for you. But when you've made that decision and you're committed to it, the spirit world will assist you. They can't do it for us. Yeah. Um, what is it Sandra says? The universe will work with you, but not for you. Hmm. <laughs> I, I think one of the things we, we, we taught a lot is that we're like glass houses. Your thoughts and intentions are always going to the spirit world and they'll hear mm -hmm. that. So if you keep those dreams, those the, those aspirations and inspirations that you, you want to achieve there and hold and believe with them true that goes to the spirit world and they will start to manifest for you but again where i started um, right at the beginning with you courtney where i said i need to apologize to all those tutors i think also i need to apologize for this, to the spirit world <laughs> for all the questions and challenges we were no different. We 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 re, we probably pestered the other side of them, uh, uh, life out of them. Actually, they probably thought, "Yeah, we're off." I have the most patient spirit team ever. Exactly, and mine must be even more patient than that. They must be laid back on a beach somewhere, thinking, "Yep, he's at it again." Um, but it, it's understanding we're, we're normal people that we, we have the questions uh, yeah. and everything. So, actually, the, the, that moment I surrendered was probably the biggest movement within my mediumship where all of a sudden I stopped pushing I stopped trying to get somewhere and I just sat giving and just said I'm here I just give you all my love and that's mm. when I had some of the most prolific experiences with the spirit world that challenge modern science and convention and and that really starts to open your mind and it shows you what boundaries we set ourselves within our own self-limiting beliefs and once they start to dissipate not disappear but dissipate we're able mm -hmm. to touch the potential that lies within all of us so if i could recommend one thing that i stop asking questions and just surrender to them but if they did have a question the reason we do our <laughs> we do once a month it's called let's talk mediumship because people have questions yes. we answer but we answer the questions in a way that create more questions because that's how phil and i learn we learn from having debate we learn from having discussions and we know that a lot of the people that work with us and train with us have questions so that's once i think it's the first wednesday of the month we've got all the recordings from previous ones but people can get they don't have to turn or not they can get the recording to it but it's people naturally have questions and phil said earlier the only daft question is the one that isn't asked mm. yes well it's been an absolute pleasure having you both phil and carrie on the show and for sharing your experiences and your thoughts on mediumship mediumship development and some really good advice for those listeners that are on the pursuit of developing this beautiful faculty can you let our listeners know what you have coming up where they can reach you well they can get in touch with us on the website which is www.thespiritandsoulfoundation.co.uk we're on social media all the normal avenues what we've got coming up is the weekly development classes that we have and um, there's two different sorts there's the big groups that's found for the foundations then the harder classes or should i say that the, the ones that are really disciplined we also have um, this weekend coming up what we call the altered states of consciousness where we walk people through the different states of the consciousness 
give them an experience, but we give them a layer by layer approach so they've got a good understanding of it. And if anybody wants to access any of the recordings of the courses we've done, then on our website, they can, if you go to pre-recorded courses, you'll get access to all the pre-recorded courses there. There's access in the shop to all of our CDs um, or downloads, but we have every week, um, the weekly courses have been recorded as well. So if you feel, oh, I've missed the beginning of the year, there is a way you can go back and get January through to April and then join us in whichever month that we happen to be finding this. Because what we've done is with the, the weekly courses is to, as Phil said, layer it. So if you get the first few months under your belt, you will come in not feeling like a fish out of water. As long as you've mm -hmm. listened to the first um, few classes, you'll come in with an understanding because we feel that everybody is entitled to have an understanding about the psychic and the mediumship yeah. of their own ability. Yes, and we've got some really exciting news that we can't really share with you right now. That's but okay. All I'll, say, all, I'll say, all I'll say about it is that we've it will be more accessible to people and we are planning to be in Canada. We are planning to be in different parts of America. Um, it's all in the process, but we don't want to give anything away because we want it surprising. We want it to be um, different because I don't and, think it's been done before. And looking at a hybrid of live and online, mm. because we've had some people with us, as you know, online since 2020 and they're still learning with us yeah. um, and still taking part because we have a huge community worldwide we go from your side of Canada down to we've got people in Hong Kong people in New um, New Zealand all over Australia and in throughout Europe as well and in different parts of Asia and of course North America, South America and Canada. So we've got a beautiful community and they are all supportive and they're all in contact with one another. They are, it's, 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 it's almost like a family. They're all supporting each other. They're all there rooting for each other. There's no egos, there's no comparisons, there's, there's no competition. Um, it, it just, sometimes it gets us quite emotional but we want to get everyone together uh, and bring them together just so they can meet each other in person. So Our dream would be to get over to the North Americas and have coffee, just pull up into a place and put something up on social media and say, we're here, come and join us. Yeah. I don't think that'll be too far away. And we can go and stop with Courtney now. That's <laughs> it, there we go. <laughs> That's exciting. I'm definitely going to be staying tuned, watching the website, asking my listeners to do the same so that they can connect with two beautiful souls and beautiful mentors that I'm sure each of us can learn from. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so Thank much. You, Thank Courtney. you, Courtney. Thank you.